interested in is, hey, we got Brother Kevin on the door now. He's an usher. They, they, they reeled him in. <laughs> reeled him in. So we thank God for that. Amen. Amen. And let us continue to encourage and strengthen one another. Amen. Amen. Mothers, I know what you're saying. You can get a better topic than that. Not for today. That's the best one for today, right? Mothers. I really don't look forward to preaching special days anymore um, because of the fact that they have different meanings to different people. And it's sometimes it maybe takes away from what's needed. So what I try to do and what I'm trying to do today, I'm praying that this message, even though I'm talking about mothers, it will speak some encouragement and help to all of you. I need your prayers this morning. I don't like to ever uh, say anything, but I'm not at the top of my game today health-wise. Um, say what? I either got a um, pulled muscle or a pinched nerve. And so, if you see me moving funny and looking funny, that's why. All right, just understand that. So, I need your prayers as I try to preach. Amen. Mothers. We find in Genesis chapter 3, verse 20, and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Brother Byron mentioned that when he was talking. He was talking about we're here because of mothers. And we're alive because everybody, even though we, our souls, and we come from the heart of God, and we come from God, because all souls are his, but we get here through our mother. Amen. Amen. Mothers are very, and, and that's true, because that's the beginning mothers are the carriers of our natural life. Amen. Amen. Psalms 139 and 13 says, For you created my inmost being. You, this is the psalmist talking, and he's talking to God. You knit me together, where? In my mother's womb. Amen mothers. Here we are Mother's Day and we do want to uh, specifically acknowledge our appreciation for mothers. But as I said there are many challenges that we are facing. Some mothers are sometimes people are discouraged, depressed, sad, lonely, uh, hurting on this day and to some it's a day of celebration. But we got to be mindful of that that everybody needs something. Um, but we're going to talk about mothers. And I'm glad I have a few young people in here today because mothers are important and you need to cherish. And I think Brother Byron, I believe Byron looked at my sermon before. Uh, I got to watch that in the future. Uh, mothers, number one, they are to be honored. Mothers are to be honored. It's always right, and not just on Mother's Day. Amen. Amen. Not just Mother's Day, but mothers are to be honored. Amen. That's right. Deuteronomy 5 and 16. God says to us, honor your father and your mother. It says, as the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Amen. That's the promise that was made, the command that was given in Deuteronomy. But we find that same command and that same uh, rehashing of that promise in the New Testament in the book of Ephesians, right? Ephesians 6, it says, children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. For this is the right thing 
to do. Honor, say honor, honor. your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. This is the first commandment with a promise. Who makes the promise? God does. What does he promise? This is it. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well with you. Who can testify to that being true? And you will have a long life on the earth. When we look at the word honor in Hebrew, it means to give weight to someone. Amen. You honor someone by giving weight to them in your life. You do this by giving them respect or authority in your life. Amen. That's how you do it. See, when we're children, the parents and the mother since it's Mother's Day are the central figure, authority figure in our lives, right? Amen. When we're children. So they just tell us what to do and we do it. Young lady, they tell us what to do and we do it, right? Right? You messed up being the only one in here. <laughs> right. That's right, right? <laughs> Let me find any more. Yeah, yeah. They tell us what to do and we do it. Right? Right. Or we don't do it and wish we had a. Right? But as we get old and adults, it shifts, it changes, right? The di dynamics change, but see, the problem is this, and our mothers might get offended, but I'm good at offending people anyway. So uh, the thing is this, the, it, the dynamic shifts, but they don't want to shift. They still want to tell us what to do. And then we do it. Uh, but it shifts. It goes from one of central authority to one of uh, great respect. So when our mothers or our parents, as we uh, grow up, when they talk to us and give us advice, we respect that because we know what it comes with. Right? And if we're smart, we'll do it. I just want to just by a show of hands or even just don't even show your hand, just shake your head or either just say amen or just don't say anything. But how many of us can testify to the fact that a lot of things went south because we didn't listen to the wisdom of our parents? If I'd only listen to my mama or if I don't listen to my daddy, that's happened so many times, right? And it's so sad because so many serious situations youth and children get into if they would have listened to the wisdom of their parents because the parents told them up front that I wouldn't do that if I were you. Amen. I know that for a fact, and you did it anyway. And then you have to call, make that phone call. Mama, Dad, what is it? I'm in trouble. And too many times they, and, and parents don't say it, but some of them do. I told you. <laughs> oh, yeah, you dread that, don't you? But you know they're going to come see about you, though, right? Yeah. So you're not really, listen, children, no matter how old we are, we're always bound to respect our parents. Always. Now, I don't know about a lot of you, but I tell you about me and my mama. As it relates to age, I'm actually older than my mama now. So that's a real dynamic shift. Amen. Honor. Mothers ought to be honored. 
right? Amen. That's biblical, and we're coming from the Bible. If we honor them, God will bless us. That's a promise, right? He promises that to us. Not only that, not only are mothers to be honored, but mothers are a source of our comfort, aren't they? Byron mentioned that too. Say when something happens, you get hurt. The first thing you want to do, call on your mama. You run, bypass everybody till you get to mama. Because they are a source of comfort. Amen. And they are. God made them that way. Isaiah 66 and 13 says, as a mother comforts her child, and she does, so will I comfort you. And will be comfort, and you will be comforted over Jerusalem. And this is what God says to us. And see, that's a prom that's a blessing to all of us. That as a, not only are our mothers a source of comfort, but God is a source of comfort. He is our comforter. Yes, He is, and He's a sort of He's He is a source of comfort. And in that, our mothers are our first, they, they nurture us. They, uh, we are the first, they, we are first in their arms and, and we're under their tutelage. They are the first ones, right? And they nurture us and they give us encouragement and they strengthen us, right? Words of encouragement and they help us to become who we are. Amen. The way God set it up, that's the way it was. Uh, you know, people say, you're a mama's boy, you're a, a mother's child. Oh, yeah, because mothers are the ones that nurture you and, and comfort you and grow you while dad's out there working. Are supposed to be. Right. And it's the mother that helps you to be, and mold you into becoming who you are. She'll make you tender, but Dad will make you tough. Tender, tough. That's a good combination, ain't it? <laughs> tough and tender, Byron said. Third thing, and I'm just about through, y'all. I know y'all said I'm glad because I'm finding it hard to stay awake. Number three, the mothers are our first teachers. They are. These commandments in Deuteronomy 6, 6 and 7 says, These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Proverbs 1 says, Listen, my son, to your father's instructions. But listen to this part. And do not forsake your mother's teaching. They are a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. That's right. Do not forsake your mother's teaching. They're our first teachers. Amen. Amen. And I know we don't have any young mothers in here with little bitty children. Um, but the thing is, we put too much focus on what the school system does. Because we are the first teachers. Amen. And if you do what you're supposed to do, we ain't got to worry about the school. That's true. That's true. But the problem is, too many of us want our children, to, um, our teachers, and the schools to be the teachers and developers of our children. But God never intended for that to be so. That's right. That's right. They don't have to teach a child to pray in school. You should have already taught that child to pray at home before he goes to school. You don't have to have the school to tell a child what's right or wrong. You should have already taught that child what's right or wrong at home before he goes to school. And you should continue to teach him. The older he gets, the deeper the teachings that you should give to him. And then you live in a way that he respect you and you've raised him in that way. So he's not going to pay attention to what that teacher says when it violates what you've said. Hopefully you've taught him the right way. Amen. Amen. That's enough of that. But mothers are uh, first teachers. Not the dad, because where's dad? Working. 
I know what y'all are saying. Hey, where you been the last hundred years? Dad ain't the only one working. Mama working too. And the truth is, we got to honor our mothers because in 99.9% .9 of homes, mothers work just like the uh, men's, the fathers work, and then the mothers come home and work. Man want to sit down and drink a beer and watch a game while mother cleans the house, prepares the dinner, take care of everything, right? And then the husband want to complain about the dinner being cold. And his beer being warm. I might be hurting, but I'm still me. Y'all know I'm going to talk like this. And I applaud that. I applaud women that do triple duty. I know, not, no, 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 triple duty. They take care of the job. They take care of the home. They take well, quadruple duty. They take care of the children, and they take care of that man. So let's give our women, our mothers, a hand of a hand clap. There's no sacrifice made like the sacrifice of a mother. Going to work is easy. You can get mad and quit. You get another job. But you can't quit that child. Amen. Now those are the three things I had about a mother. So let's talk about some lessons we can learn from some mothers of the Bible. Just give me a few minutes. It won't take long. I'm going to give you the uh, Reader's Digest version of this. Y'all remember those Reader Digest? Yeah. Them the stories is pretty cool, right? Because they wasn't all that long. So we're going to give the Reader's Digest. <laughs> I want us to focus on two women in particular. One is Sarah, the mother of Abraham. The other is Hannah. Not the mother of Abraham, I'm sorry. The wife of Abraham, the mother of Isaac. And Hannah who is the mother of Samuel. You remember Samuel, right? And you remember um, Isaac. They're very uh, pointed and powerful stories that the Bible has recorded for us. But I want to talk to us as a people, but using uh, Sarah and Hannah as examples to us in life. So I want you to listen closely. I want you to hear what I got to say. Ain't going to be no tune up. It's just going to be some teaching. I want you to hear this. Are y'all listening? Sarah. Sarah was Abram's wife. Sarah was a beautiful woman. You know that, right? I don't know how Abraham got her. But she was beautiful. She was so beautiful that the king of Egypt wanted her. Y'all know the story, right? Because of the famine, they went down into Egypt. And uh, the king saw Sarah and how beautiful she was. And he said, okay. And you know what the king did? He just took who he wanted, right? And he asked, who is this fine woman here, Abram? Ah, uh, that's my sister. He had enough faith to follow God out of, out of his home, but not enough to trust God in a strange land, right? And we know what happened, right? God said, wait, this ain't going to happen. This is not going to happen. This is not in my plan. Say my plan. God has a plan. Now, I want to say this about God's plan. We don't always understand his plan. As a matter of fact, the life of faith is a life lived on not seeing the picture all the way. You don't see it. 
but you by faith you believe that's why we walk by faith and not by sight because we don't always see God's plan sometimes I wonder and we don't understand how God is doing what he's doing and why he's doing and we don't have to that don't change the fact that God has one just because you don't know God's plan doesn't mean God doesn't have a plan just because you can't see the path doesn't mean God is not leading you in the way you should go just because you are in the dark don't mean that God is not leading. Right? So God wouldn't let that happen. The king said, Abram, what have you done? Why do you tell me? Because something ain't going on. God ain't letting something happen here because God is in control. And Abram was able to leave there with a whole lot of stuff with him that was good and bad. But let me tell you about that. God had a plan. The plan was for Abraham and Sarah to be the, for them to have a child. And they knew that Abraham was going to be the father of many nations, that his seed would be greater than the sand that's on the seashore. God already made that promise, a promise, that promise to them. Now, they hear the promise, but they don't see the way. Now, do you know that for, what, 11, 12, 13 years, they waited on the promise that God had made? They waited. They waited so long, uh, they can stand that Sarah said, wait a minute, I'm old, you old, I'm dead, you, I don't know. Take Hagar and let's help God fulfill his promise. Is that kind of how it went? Let's help God. Yeah, yeah. So what happened to her is what happens because she didn't fully believe and trust God to do what he could do. That she tried to help God. She tried to make it happen. How many of us try to make it happen? Because we don't fully trust God. That didn't turn out well, did it? I mean, Abram was happy at first, but that didn't last. Because Sarah wasn't happy with Ishmael in the house. Right? Now listen, 12 years, 13 years, then it, then Sarah said, we're going to help God because, so go ahead and take Hagar. She's, she ain't dead. I'm dead. Abraham said, okay. <laughs> Say, sound like a plan, honey. God came back to them. What, about 11 years, 10 years later? They ain't got real old now. And said, you're going to have a son. Hagar's going to, I mean, Sarah's going to have a child. You're going to have this son that I promised. You know what Sarah did? She laughed. That's what it says. She laughed to herself and thought, Genesis 18, after I am worn out and my Lord, that's Abram, Abraham, is old. I'm worn out. He's old. Will I now have this pleasure? you got to be kidding me. Sure. Ain't happening, Captain. 25 years. Listen to me real good. 25 years of waiting for God to fulfill his promise. 25 years waiting on God to fulfill his promise. She wondered if it would ever happen. 25 years 
having heard God's promise, wandering for 25 years. God, is this going to happen? Things are not looking like it's going to happen. Wait, the uh, time is getting short. It, it, it's, it's, it's like I'm running out of time. Is this going to happen? 25, you got to hear that, 25 years she spent wondering if God is going to fulfill his promise to her. Five years. But we know the story, and I guess, I mean, and she knows too because they had the son Isaac. So we know that God fulfilled his promise, right? Amen. We know when I told you when I started this story that God had a plan, God made a promise. Time didn't prevent the fulfillment of the promise. But in that time, Sarah wondered if it was going to happen. Ain't that like us? We know what God promised. But we wonder if he's going to do it. As time progresses, as time moves on, we wonder when is it going to happen. And then as it moves on, we begin to say, I don't think it's going to happen. I know what God said, but I don't know. Time has passed and it hadn't happened yet. Even when I've gotten in the way and messed it up. I know it's not going to happen now. Time kept moving. Amen. I imagine 25 years seemed like 250 years. Because when you're waiting on something, time stands still. But for 25 years, there she was waiting on God to fulfill the promise that he had made 25 years earlier. She tried to help God because she saw that it was not possible naturally within her body. So she tried to help God fulfill his promise. And we know that didn't turn out right. So now he finally fulfills it, but it's 25 years later. Sarah didn't believe God fully because if she would have, she wouldn't have, number one, tried to help him out. Number two, she wouldn't have laughed when he said it was going to happen next year. All right. Yeah. All right. Right. So we see that in 25 years, she didn't fully believe God, even though God made a promise to them 25 years earlier, even though she tried to help God out because she felt that she was running out of time. And even though that didn't go well and God looked past that by his grace, came back to her and said, I promise you a child and it's going to be here this time next year. In spite of all that, she still laughed. So what I'm trying to tell you, she didn't fully believe God because she couldn't see the fulfillment of the promise in the time that she had spent waiting. Amen. What does that show us? What does that mean to us? That means that we don't have to have be perfect in our belief because God's promise is greater than our momentary struggles of unbelief. God's, listen, God's promise is is greater than our temporary struggles with not believing God. So I'm going to tell you, if God said it, in spite of you, God is going to fulfill his promise. You just got to learn to trust him. You don't have to be perfect, and, and, and sometimes we struggle with that. Lord, is it because I didn't believe enough? Is it because something this, something that? But I stop by to tell you, God is going to do what he's going to do when he wants to do it, how he wants to do it. And listen, your temporary moments of, moments of unbelief and doubt and, and, and your indecisions and wrong decisions will not stop the promise and the plan of God from going forth. You can trust him even though you can't trace him. God is faithful to his word. Just hold on. And just keep living. Because we all struggle with believing. We don't want to admit it because we think if we acknowledge and admit that, then God is going to take away a demerit from us. We're going to lose something. You know, like maybe it's going to set it back even more. No, 
God understands in our humanity that sometimes we doubt what he has said. And if you sit here and say that it never happens, you are lying. I know that's a strong word. Dad didn't like for us to say lie growing up. I guess he'd get as upset about us saying you telling the lies if we said a cuss word. But if you say that there's moments that you lose your ability to believe and trust God in situations and you feel doubt that it's going to happen, you're not telling the truth. But I want to encourage you to understand that God knows your humanity. God knows your weakness. God knows how much you can stand and how much you can bear. God knows when you are struggling with doubt and unbelief. God knows when you're struggling with problems, pains, and temptation. God knows all of that, and God loves you in that. And God wants to help you in that. And God is not going to penalize you for that. That's not going to stop the fulfillment of his promise. Got to trust him. I might not see it. I don't understand it. But God, I'm trusting you with it. And the strongest area of faith we can have is this. That in spite of what happens and what we see, we still trust God. Amen. Last, last one I want to talk about, uh, Hannah. We know who Hannah was, right? She needed, a, she wanted a child bad. Because they understood that if you don't have a son, then you'll look down upon in that culture. And in her anguish, she prayed to the Lord. 1 Samuel 1 and 10, weeping bitterly, she prays to God. She's in deep anguish, and, and she prays to the Lord. In her anguish, she prays to the Lord. She prays to the Lord. See, we don't see anywhere where Sarah prayed. We don't see where Sarah looked to God and, and cried out to God. As a matter of fact, she reached out to her handmaiden and, and she spoke to her husband and they created a problem. But Hannah, we see that Hannah prayed to God. And God heard her prayer. You got to understand this. You got to learn, and that's one of the things not only as mothers, but as all of us as believers, we got to learn the power of prayer. We got to learn that when we're going through anything, when we're uh, delinquent in anything, when we're deficit anything, we've got to learn to lean and depend on him. And we've got to learn that we might not have the answer, but we know the answer. We know who has the answer. We might not can remedy the situation, but we know the one that can. We've got to learn to call on him. You got to spend time with, you got to talk to God about it. You got to tell him your trouble. You got to tell him your pain. You got to tell him your struggle. Too many times we want to talk to people. It's good to have somebody you can talk to, but there ain't nobody like the Lord. How many know he can do what no other can do? She shows us that. Amen. And that's what we need to learn. We've got to, even though it seemed like the promise has been delayed and it's not going to happen, we can't even see it happening. But we've got to learn to trust God. Amen. We've got to learn to lean on him. We need to learn to pray. Man to always pray. And not faint. Amen. Prayer is the key. Amen. Prayer is the source of our, pro our power. Yeah, yeah. Prayer is what gets God's attention. Prayer is what opens the door yeah. to the treasures of heaven. Yeah. It is prayer that causes us to be able to walk. And keep on moving. Prayer. It is the key. Prayer can go places we can't go. And prayer can accomplish things we can't do. 
Prayer gets heaven's attention and shakes the foundation of earth. Prayer helps make ways out of no way. It is through prayer that doors are open that man can't close. Prayer is the way that windows are open and blessings come forth. We got to learn to when we are uh, in pain and problems have manif are manifested and are manifold in our lives. When we find ourselves with our backs up against the wall. When we feel as if there is no hope and there is no help. We've got to learn not to turn from God, but we got to learn to turn to him. Yes, Have I got a witness? And when we learn to lean on him, the old deacons used to say he is a leaning post. And uh, we know within ourselves that God will make a way out of no way. Have I got a witness here? I might as well sit down because you don't believe what I'm telling you. But I wish I had about three witnesses here that didn't mind testifying that I called on the Lord and he heard my prayer. Have I got a witness in him? Well, as I go to my seat, y'all, if you don't want to testify, I'm so glad that the Bible is full of witnesses that I can use. Have I got a witness? You remember, don't you, when Paul and Silas was locked up in jail? The Bible says that one began to sing and the other began to pray. When they prayed, uh, yeah, uh, the jailhouse rocked, uh, the earth began to rock and reel, uh, and the door was open. Uh, prayer has a way of opening doors uh, and making ways. Uh, ain't it all right? Uh, well, I got another witness. Uh, I told you on last week uh, that Peter was in jail uh, and the saints went down in prayer. Prayer got the attention of heaven. Uh, it shook the gates of heaven. Uh, God and the angel lean over heaven's balcony and said, listen, they heard the prayer going up as a sweet smelling savior. God said to an angel there, go down and see about Peter. We know the story, yes, he came down. Peter was sleeping in jail, uh, chained, uh, but the angel came, um, set him free, uh, he loosed his shackles, uh, somebody here needs some shackles loosened, uh, and it's going to happen in prayer. Hannah prayed, uh, and God gave her Samuel. Uh, I stopped by to tell you, uh, if you can't see it, uh, keep on trusting God. Uh, if you can't see it, uh, keep on seeking it. Uh, and how do you seek it? Uh, by saying to the Savior, Father, I stretch my hand, my hand to thee. No other help I know. Have I got a witness here? He will. I say he will. He will make a way. Have I got a witness? Look at your neighbor and say he may not come when you want him, but he's on time. Yes, he is. He's an on-time God. He's an on-time God. He's an on-time God. He will wipe tears from your eyes. He will lift up the brokenhearted. He will 
give strength to the weak, uh, light to those in darkness, uh, direction to the lost. Uh, he will uh, walk with you. Uh, won't he do it? Uh, won't he hold your hand? Uh, won't he guide your path? Uh, won't he give you joy? Uh, won't he give you hope? Uh, won't he give you health? Uh, he will uh, hold you when you get weak. Uh, he'll carry you. Uh, you need to learn uh, to go to him in prayer. I'm through now, uh, but as children of God, uh, we got to trust him uh, when we can't trace him. Uh, we've got to look to him uh, when we can't even see our way. Uh, we've got to call on him uh, in the heat of the day. Uh, I heard, uh, I said I heard, uh, and I'm through, y'all. Uh, I'm ending with prayer. The psalmist said, I was in a horrible pit. I was in a pit. I was stuck in the miry mud. I was stuck in that pit. I couldn't make my way out. I couldn't climb my way. I couldn't crawl my way. But I called. I said, I called. I called on the Lord. What did he do? He heard my cry and he lifted me out of that pit. He made a way. He made a way. I, I guess I got off mothers, but it said he's a mother for the motherless. He's a father.